Greetings. I'm Dr. Michelle Kuhl. I teach history at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. This is a talk on Unit 7, Progressives. My title is Progressives and Southern Segregation. First, I will briefly define the progressives. Next, I'll look at a statement from the College Board course and exam description. Then I'm going to play with that statement. I'll first attempt to support the statement with evidence and analysis. Then I will attempt to refute the statement. Finally, and this is the hardest, I'll attempt to modify the statement. This is a game you can play with other historical claims. Although there was a political party in 1912 called the Progressive Party, it is really historians who call this era the Progressive Era and these groups of people progressives. These individuals and groups did not necessarily call themselves progressives or think of themselves as being linked together. Historians themselves disagree over the parameters of this era and these people, but overall agree that many people in this time period shared three characteristics and thus could be grouped together into a category. First, they believed that progress was possible. The Gilded Age and Progressive Era had many technical achievements that fired people's belief in progress. Trains eroded traditional limits on time and space. The Golden Spike connected coasts in 1869. Factories built on water power and the principle of interchangeable parts produced massive amounts of goods. By 1900, the United States had rocketed into the number one spot in the world in terms of mass production. This production led to cheaper goods and an overall higher standard of living. Additionally, advances in medical training and public health meant that people were healthier and lived longer. In the arena of scientific theory, Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species, published in 1859, gave an explanation for the mechanism of evolution. Scientists were energized and ideas about evolution seeped into popular understanding. Although Darwin's work did not speak to the impact of evolution on human beings, many others took his ideas and applied them to human society. There was an enhanced belief that society was evolving into higher forms, underscoring a general feeling of progress. The second characteristic of progressives is that they believe study and scientific knowledge were important. These were not romantics or transcendentalists looking inward to their own fancies or outward to a mystical oversoul. Progressives thought that by collecting information and looking for patterns, they could help understand problems and craft solutions. This was true of scientific pursuits in the lab and of people studying human interactions. For example, Jane Addams and other reformers like her studied the emerging field of sociology and applied scientific methods of data collection, looking for patterns to improve human society. This map illustrates a trend. At Hull House in Chicago, Jane Addams and her team collected information on the lives of immigrants, often mapping out the data to look for patterns. Another subset of this characteristic of study and knowledge was in the realm of journalism. So-called muckrakers went into the field, sometimes undercover, and studied factories, slums, riots, monopolies, meatpacking plants, and other grimy corners of life to document injustices, and then splashed their seedy stories in print. These journalists believed in the power of exposure. They thought that if you studied problems, collected information, and brought that information to the public, then the public could respond appropriately and demand solutions. Finally, progressives believed big problems needed big solutions. For example, with the rise of industrial capitalism came brutal working conditions and low pay for many workers. With large industrial operations came large labor uprisings, like the Homestead Strike in 1892. Workers in the town of Homestead, Pennsylvania struck for better wages and conditions. The company hired armed guards called the Pinkertons, and the town lay in wait for the guards to come by and then had them run a gauntlet. Hundreds of members of the town, including the women, lined up to beat and batter the company guards. I mean, look at those umbrellas. Those ladies are ready. These kinds of uprisings depicted in print and you can see had illustrations uh, alarm the public. It seemed like a war was going on between labor and capital. As businesses grew and integrated their processes, they formed monopolies, also called trusts. Trusts increasingly controlled vast sectors of the economy, 
and could dictate the wages and prices of goods. Labor riots, business monopolies, contaminated food, and other ills of the day seemed so vast that many progressives believed only a large entity, such as the government, would be able to field effective solutions. So to recap, progressives believed in progress. They thought study was important, and they thought big problems needed big solutions. OK, now we have a handle on the definition of the progressives. So let's take a look at a statement from the course and exam description. Progressives supported Southern, Southern segregation. Here's what I'll do with this statement. OK, first, I'm going to try and support it with evidence and analysis. Next, I'll try to refute it. And finally, and this is always the trickiest, I'll try to modify it. OK, here we go on this first task. Many classic progressives uh, supported Southern segregation. Uh, the prime example is Teddy Roosevelt. He was the vice president for William McKinley. And when McKinley was shot in 1901, Roosevelt became president, and then he was elected to the presidency in his own right in 1904. He's perhaps the person most associated with the progressive movement. He championed the idea of progress in his own life, developing himself from a sickly, weak young man into a healthy, hearty athlete with his recipe of the strenuous life. He fought monopolies and got a reputation as a trust buster. Horrified by the description of contaminated meat production in the muckraking novel, The Jungle, Roosevelt turned to the government solution of a law, the Pure Food and Drug Act, that led to a government agency, the FDA, to enforce these provisions. During his presidency, he worried that uh, this industrial growth was um, destroying a lot of our natural environment and championed establishing national parks and in his lifetime, he protected millions of acres of natural land. In the 1912 election, he ran on the Bull Moose Party, widely considered to be the Progressive Party. But under his watch as president, he allowed Southern segregation to grow unchecked. Indeed, he made several statements supporting white supremacy. For example, he once made a speech encouraging white women to have more babies so the white race could continue to outnumber other races. Yikes. Despite urging from anti-lynching activists, Teddy Roosevelt did not use the power of the federal government to investigate the scourge of lynch law. One of the most heartbreaking episodes was the Brownsville incident of 1906. Black soldiers were stationed at Fort Brown in Brownsville, Texas, a segregated town, and were accused of being involved in a fight that resulted in the death of a white bartender and the wounding of a police officer. White townspeople insisted that black soldiers were the instigators of the fight. There was no trial. The soldiers were not allowed to te give testimony or defend themselves. 167 were targeted. President Teddy Roosevelt ordered them discharged from the army without honor. Journalists who looked more closely at the situation and interviewed people in the town determined that the soldiers were actually documented to be in their barracks at the time of the incident. Moreover, they uncovered that white townspeople were opposed to black men in uniform and that the police in the town did not interfere with or protect black soldiers when they were targeted for insults and even beatings. But instead of looking closely at the situation, Teddy Roosevelt ordered the dishonorable discharge. In 1972, the army revisited this incident and found the soldiers innocent. But back in 1906, many people were heartbroken by the action. This was an actual tragedy ruining the lives of many men and their families, and it was also a symbolic tragedy. During a time when many white Americans did not see African Americans as citizens, black soldiers were a symbol of citizenship. If someone is willing to fight and die for their country, they've earned it. So stripping black men of their soldier status was seen as a larger statement on black rights and citizenship. Another famous progressive was Frances Willard, the leader of the Women's Christian Temperance Organization. My students never get very excited about this organization, despite my best efforts. Um, but really, it was, it was a far larger organization than the suffrage movement. Many, many, many more women were in the WCTU and excited about getting rid of alcohol than were in the suffrage movement. So if, if you, that might be a good way to think about the scale of this. This was more popular than voting. Uh, although their main focus was opposition to alcohol, the group's motto was do everything. And they developed a number of different departments, uh, only one of which was alcohol. 
They championed labor reform, prison reform, children's health, and, and many, many, many other things. Um, there were chapters all over the nation. Northern chapters were integrated with white and black women working together. However, Southern chapters were segregated. Willard allowed this to happen, and though, also, although often challenged, she did not waver. Many people admired her for her considerable influence in reform, and some considered her the moral center of the United States. She was challenged once to comment on the issue of lynching and asked, uh, why was she silent on this? If she, if she was the moral center of America, what, what did she have to say about this tremendous outrage that had been going on? But she dismissed lynching as an outgrowth of alcohol and criminality by African-Americans. So clearly Frances Willard, the leader of the largest reform movement in the country, supported segregation. In a similar vein, the suffrage movement allowed Southern chapters to segregate. Although working for the right of women to vote, the leaders of the movement were not willing to divide their energies and ensure that black women in the South also had the right to vote. In 1913, Alice Paul organized a massive, massive suffrage parade in DC. Chapters from states around the country came to march and some had white and black women who planned to march together, such as the delegation from Illinois. But Southern delegates insisted on a segregated parade and threatened to walk out if their demands were not met. So Alice Paul allowed this to happen. The suffrage movement successfully passed the 19th Amendment in 1920, but in all their work for citizenship rights as a whole, the movement did not take a strong stance and challenge segregation. Another large area of the progressive movement was labor unions. The AFL, the American Federation of Labor, had language at the national level about racial unity. So on paper, they were in favor of integration, but they allowed Southern chapters to segregate their unions and never took very strong action to stop that practice. Occasionally at meetings or in publications, some union members would suggest ending segregation and working together to bond in brotherhood across racial lines. One example here is the Firemen's Union. Uh, their magazine had an issue where they raised the suggestion of ending segregation in Southern chapters, but letters poured in from the South opposing this move. The reasoning was that the union should focus on bread and butter issues like higher wages and better working conditions. So on the whole, the labor unions supported Southern segregation. Overall, in the arenas of labor reform and politics, prominent progressive leaders and organizations allowed and even at times encouraged segregation. Okay, so that was task one. Whew, that seemed like a pretty solid stance. Still, it's a good practice to flip your position. Try to argue the opposite. It's good for keeping an open mind. When you look at evidence, try not to just cram the evidence into an assumption you already have. Try to see if you can draw a new conclusion from evidence. Be open to new interpretations. So now I'll try to refute this statement. So far, all the progressives I've mentioned are white and the groups are majority white, but there are many African-American activists in this time period. Normally, historians cluster them in a different category as part of the long civil rights movement. But can we also call them progressives? Take Ida B. Wells, for example. She was born enslaved in Mississippi, was emancipated during the Civil War, and as a young adult moved to Memphis, Tennessee and worked as a teacher and then a journalist. After her friend Thomas Moss was murdered by a lynch mob, she began investigating lynching and exposed the practice as an enforcement arm of white supremacy. She traveled to sites where lynching happened, interviewed people, collected data, and documented patterns of lies and stereotypes. Her expose made her famous, but it was also dangerous. She was targeted for retaliation and her press was burned. A group of African-American women in the Northeast funded her continued work and her publications fundamentally changed the way Americans saw lynching. She lobbied for state action to prevent lynching and to punish members of lynch mobs. Okay, so let's check her against our definition of progressives. Believes in progress? Yes, otherwise why do this? Uh, study and exposure? Yes. And big problems need big solutions? Yeah. So can we call Ida B. Wells a progressive? Here's a quick activity for you. Check your textbook if you have one or, you know, one handy. Um, look up Ida B. Wells, you know, try the index, 
Uh, is she on the section on muckrakers or is she in a different section on the South and segregation? If she's not listed, if, you're, if your textbook has a section on muckrakers, take a look at that. Is Adby Wells listed as a muckraker? And if not, why not? What's a muckier mess than lynching? Okay, stay with me. Um, if we consider Adby Wells and other Black activists as progressives, then we have some ammunition to refute our statement. This does not exonerate the other white progressives, but it broadens the field of who the progressives are. Um, we can add maybe W.E.B. Du Bois to this broader category of progressives. Uh, William Edward Burkhart Du Bois was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and grew up in uh, going to school at integrated schools, went to Harvard, earned a PhD, um, really one of the great intellectuals uh, in American history. He worked as a sociologist in Atlanta University in Georgia. In 1904, he published The Souls of Black Folk, uh, a really breakthrough book of the early 20th century. He clearly opposed segregation and stood in favor of civil rights. Du Bois saw the Reconstruction period as a great achievement that was then undercut by redemption and a rollback um, of the promise of the Reconstruction Amendments. He was deeply critical of the betrayal of Black civil rights and the rise of segregation in the 1890s and early 20th century. Although critical, it's clear he believed in the possibility of progress. Much of his work was to document the shortcomings of America's promise of equality in the hopes of correcting course. While he worked as a sociologist, he collected data on Black lives and presented his findings to the public to challenge racist assumptions. He believed in the power of study to change minds. In 1909, I think that's right. Oh, you could double check me. Um, du Bois was one of many who formed the NAACP. This is clearly part of a progressive trend. White members, many descendants of abolitionists, work with black members to document racism and work for change. The NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, supported voting rights, opposed segregation, and embraced a vision of a what they called a beloved community of all races. They raised money and took part in many strategies to tackle racism. They gathered data on lynching, segregation, injustice in the criminal justice system, and presented their findings to the public in pamphlets, news reports, and their magazine called The Crisis. They hired lawyers to fight injustice through the court system and lobbied state and federal governments to adopt anti-racist legislation. So this group really fits the definition of progressives. They believe in progress, they studied and gathered data, and they looked for big solutions, often with the government. Okay, armed with these examples of Ida B. Wells, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, and the NAACP, uh, that's my case for my task number two, that Black activists were part of the progressive movement and worked through journalism and legislation to oppose segregation. My last task is modify. Um, that's a way of saying, is there another way of framing this question? Uh, are we not just going to the extremes of supporting or refuting, but is there a third ground? Let's take a look at Booker T. Washington. He was born enslaved in West Virginia, emancipated by the Civil War, and went to Hampton University, where he excelled as a student. He was chosen to lead Tuskegee Institute in Atlanta, Alabama, excuse me. Under his leadership, the school expanded and became a model of industrial education, uh, training students for a particular uh, job, um, like farming or for the men, farming, carpentry, masonry, uh, for the women, um, cooking, uh, domestic science, um, and the idea that these were clear pathways to a, a stable job and a good income. And if you're going to work these jobs, you might be might as well be trained in the, the best, latest possible tech, techniques as possible. So under his leadership, um, the school continued to grow and he became more well-known in the South. In 1895, there's a big um, fair in Atlanta, Georgia. It was called the Cotton Exposition. And if you keep in mind the context, uh, remember it, it's not that long ago that the South, particularly Georgia, was economically devastated in the Civil War. And thanks to William Tecumseh Sherman, literally burned uh, to the ground in many places. So the South had embarked on this campaign, many people called the New South, to rebuild, try to attract industrial investment. But the South was felt very cash poor, that the, the, their defeat in the Civil War had left them with, with a very uh, poor economy. 
So this is part of the New South's drive to, you know, make a better day. So they have this huge cotton exposition and a lot of people are invited, white Southerners, a white Northern industrialist with a lot of money and uh, many African-Americans and the head of the fair invited Booker T. Washington to give a speech. And I think he was the only African-American invited to address everyone at the fair. So this was uh, a huge amount of pressure on him. So Washington knew there's a lot of all these different people in the audience. Uh, Northerners with money wondering if the South was a good business investment or not. Like maybe it's just a place with a lot of racial turmoil and fighting and they should put their money elsewhere. Um, there were white Southerners listening um, and that could be really dangerous. If he said the wrong thing, they might, they might actually turn on him and become violent. Um, and there's also African-Americans who could hear his speech um, and they're hoping for a better day. So he had this tricky task of how do you talk to all three of these groups? So he made this speech that became very famous and it became known as the Atlanta Compromise because in many ways it seemed to reach all the groups. So on the one hand, Washington clearly said in his speech that he would not oppose segregation and he encouraged African-Americans to work within the system of segregation for advancement. So that piece made Northern industrialists and white Southerners happy. So Northern industrialists thought, okay, this sounds pretty good. Um, instead of a place where people are fighting about segregation and there's gonna be a lot of uproar and turmoil and maybe labor riots and burning factories, uh, maybe it's gonna be peaceful and we should take our money and invest it in the South. White Southerners uh, love this. I mean, this is absolutely what they wanted to hear. And after they embraced Washington and considered him the leader of his race and turned to him as a spokesperson uh, for all kinds of things. However, in a compromise, you give and take. So what did Washington get in return for this stance on segregation? His language was deliberately submerged in metaphor, but many people um, from the black audience heard his message that this retreat on segregation was temporary. There was so much metaphor that white people didn't really hear that. They just heard that, great, segregation is fine. Black people heard through his metaphors like, mm, this is step one, you know, this is where we're starting. And in exchange, he was asking white Southerners to treat him more humanely, to treat him and his people more humanely and, just, and justly. So Washington had this plan to encourage industrial training uh, through these industrial education type schools, employment for black men and women in skilled trades with good salaries and stable employment and building up material success in the short term. And then perhaps in the long term, maybe down the road, full citizenship. So he doesn't spell that out concretely, but again, it's shrouded in a lot of metaphor. So he did this you know, pretty amazing thing of making all three groups pretty happy. Um, he had a lot of critics, including uh, Du Bois and others who did not wanna speak in metaphors and uh, butter up white Southerners with the best version of themselves and who wanted to speak plainly about the injustices of the day. Um, but still at the time Washington uh, became nationally famous, white Northern philanthropists loved him and donated tons of money to his school. Uh, Washington regularly traveled in the North and gave talks, and got a ton of money from people like Carnegie and others. Teddy Roosevelt befriended Booker T. Washington and uh, considered him sort of a patronage broker for African-Americans. Uh, for example, there was a lot of judgeships and other really good jobs in DC. And when Roosevelt wanted to fill a judgeship with, with a, you know, a qualified and you know, a great you know, black lawyer or judge, he would ask Washington for a list of names and Washington would give them to him. So Washington had some influence with the ear of the president. Okay, so with this example of Washington, can I use this to modify my statement? Instead of fully supporting or refuting segregation, the Du Bois might have some quibble with that, could we modify the statement to say progressives compromise with segregation. Um, Booker T. Washington and his supporters definitely believed in progress. So I'm trying to hear now to, to put them in the progressive camp. So they believe in progress. The novelist Charles Chestnut called Washington a professional optimist that he was uh, so focused on moving forward and, and getting things done better. Washington School Tuskegee Institute had industrial education, but also included a fair amount of scientific uh, training. Um, students who were going to become farmers, for example, studied soils and trees and plants. The famous scientist George Washington Carver conducted many important scientific experiments there. 
In Booker T. Washington was looking for big solutions. He was very ambitious and was upfront that he was looking for some kind of pathway to progress for all African Americans. So I'm making the case that we can include Booker T. Washington as a progressive. Now that I'm looking at compromises with segregations, what about people studying at and working at segregated schools? So not just industrial schools like Tuskegee Institute, but liberal arts colleges like Atlanta University and other historically black colleges. Even if the professors there, like Du Bois, oppose segregation, aren't they compromising with it by working within it? Are the students who are working for a better day also navigating life under segregation? To be fair, many people who rejected segregation um, as a, in theory, could not reject it in practice and live in the South. They had to navigate their way around the world that they lived in. Does that mean they were compromising? My last example is Mary Church Terrell. She was born to a wealthy father in Memphis, Tennessee, went to Oberlin College, and then became a teacher and a nationally prominent reformer. Uh, she taught in Washington, D.C. at a segregated school, and her husband, Robert Terrell, was a teacher, a principal, and then later a judge in D.C. appointed on Booker T. Washington's recommendation to Teddy Roosevelt. Terrell was a leader in the National Association of Colored Women, a national organization of reform-minded women. She worked to overcome stereotypes of Black women and made stirring speeches documenting the progress Black women had made, particularly since the time of slavery. Although a champion of Black rights and racial progress, she also supported Booker T. Washington and his work. She had a liberal arts education herself, but saw the value in some people having an industrial education. So she's another person that I would call a progressive who navigated life as best she could and compromised with the issue of segregation. Okay, I've completed my three tasks. Um, I've tried to support, refute, and modify this statement. You might not be buying everything I'm selling, but that's not the point. The point is for you to consider multiple possibilities and then think for yourself. I have one final question to consider, which is, so what? Why should we care about a group of people who lived more than 100 years ago? What relevance do they have to our life? Well, consider the times we're living in. We're in the throes of a pandemic, um, our nation is uh, torn apart with really high tensions over uh, political factions. Um, I've lost uh, a close family member to the coronavirus. And in the past two weeks, two of my immediate family members have tested positive. It's tempting for me to lapse into cynicism and even despair. But I find some inspiration in the progressives. Faced with many big problems, they managed to stay optimistic. They rolled up their sleeves, took notes, trudged around on the lecture circuit, wrote articles, lobbied Congress. They often failed. They did not win every battle, but they kept plugging away. Despite setbacks, they won many victories in their lifetime and laid the groundwork for later victories, especially in this area of segregation. The NAACP's legal strategy culminated in the 1954 Supreme Court decision of Brown versus Board of Education that declared segregation illegal. So I'm going to leave you with two images from this era in that vein of, of thinking about how they, are, they can inspire us today. Um, every spring, the Crisis Magazine, which is the magazine of the NAACP, dedicated their issue to college students and celebrated their achievements. And every fall, the Crisis Magazine dedicated an issue to babies. So these photos of people who, in a time of great challenges, segregation, voter suppression, uh, extreme violence, um, they still kept an image on the future, uh, embodied in people like you, uh, bright students um, heading off after high school to greater things, and this beautiful photo of babies with books sums up the progressives for me. In a time of many challenges, they kept an eye on the promise of a beautiful future. Thank you.